Hasta la próxima. Let's get started because I have a session and I have no clue how long it will take to actually do this. I've, I've been able to do this in like 45 minutes in the past. Let's see if I talk really fast. <laughs> Skip over some slide. Hope we can do it in 30 minutes. But uh, at the same time, let's also just hope that we, uh, we arrive at uh, giving you a bit of knowledge, which is today's topic is about customer journey mapping. And uh, well, you know the drill. Which one of these pictures matches your customer's journey? Are they over the moon? Are they extremely happy with your product? Are they sort of in complete agony and pain? Or are they just completely confused when they use your product? And like, why is this happening? If you can use the chat and give me an A and B or a C. And in contrary to uh, to our usual uh, answer, there's if, if you have all three of them, that's pretty <laughs> interesting as well. I'm seeing someone typing B. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I have as well. Depending on the level of training, yeah. I hope you're not in the parachute business. <laughs> like, like, uh, yeah. So, so unfortunately, I have seen all three of them. Um, well, no, not these particular ones, but uh, in life. And, and basically, it, it tends to mean something. If you're if you're in A, that's great. You're doing something awesome because people are happy. Probably the biggest measure of your success is happy customers, right? So if, if the customers aren't excited about your products, well, you should figure out what, what's going on because that's typically... Oh, that's the wrong button. No, oh, come back, come back, come back trying to do too many things simultaneously. Uh, so that, that's typically something that's going on. Um, what we've also seen is managers saying, oh, it's going really well because we're not getting any complaints anymore at customer support. Well, that typically means the number is disconnected or they lost the email address or the function stopped working. Um, so you should get some complaints somewhere along. There should be some pain in your product because there always is. And that's the route to improvement. And, and the third one we see a lot, and it's kind of a bit odd one out, is don't make me think. Make, make it as simple as possible. Don't make me think as a user. And often the product works, people are happy, but it, it's too complicated. And all these are things that a customer journey map well, could help with you know, to improve on that. On that. And let's, let's first connect to the topic. What are things that you want to learn or talk about when you think of customer journey mapping? Could be like everything. I have no clue what it means to. Uh, well, I have this specific situation that I struggle with. Yeah, jobs to be done. I'm definitely going to talk something about that. Tell you something. Yeah. Metrics. No, we're not going to talk about metrics. Well, there's just a little bit on metrics in there. Ah, that's a good one. Stakeholder management. Yeah. What a customer really want, what customers want. That sounds like an interesting movie. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. So, so I'll, um, we'll go through the material. I'll keep an eye on the chat window to see if I can answer some of those questions. If something really stands out, you can always hang out after the, uh, the end of the session and uh, I'll, I'll try to answer as best as I can or, uh, or not if I don't know the answer, which is also possible. So uh, what I wanted to touch on is why is it a useful tool? Why should we as product managers care about customer journey mapping? What, what, where it came from, or at least what I think it came from. Uh, I'll give you a simple way of implementing it because that will get you started. Some practical examples on how you used it in the past, which may answer some of your questions and uh, maybe some tips on what you can do next. All right. Everybody wake. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So basically, often as, as product managers, we think our product ends in the box. As soon as it's in the box, it's shipped, it's done. That's at least how I thought. And actually, that's just when it begins. It, it Products keep getting challenged during their lifetime. And it can be in, in terms of 
we want more performance or um, we want to respond quicker to customer demands or to what competitors are doing or we want more functionality. So products tend to grow over multiple axes, which means that with a linear growth, it's really difficult to keep up with demand. And because it's changing over multiple axes, you're looking more at, at something like an exponential growth. And at the same time, customer expectations grow similarly, right? And I'm not sure what your expectations were or, or your experiences in that topic, but usually it feels a bit like, did we have this idea to the product is really beautiful, like a dolphin that leaps out of the water. And nah, the, from a customer's point of view, it, it looks slightly different. Uh, so we don't seem to have been able to match those expectations. And... While talking about maturity levels, often we think of maturity levels for our customers. And we look at our customers and say, yeah, but yeah, let's face it. They're like Waldorf and Stadler. I mean, these, these guys are always complaining. There must be something wrong with them. Uh, but the problem is on the other end of the, uh, of the screen. Now, wh why does this matter? So why could you tell your boss that you really need to spend some time on customer journey mapping or figuring out what customers really want. And it, it, it's because everything is connected. Um, and this is not a Mobius loop from uh, the Avengers uh, because it's, it's in there as well. But this is the, like the purchasing aid. And, and everything starts with a customer that discovers they have a problem. They went out, do some research, select a product, buy it. So the buyer circle. Uh, but then they start using it. When they start receiving it, how it's packaged, how you unwrap the box, how you maintain it, how you refill it, how you discard of it, uh, ultimately to the point that you start recommending your product to others. And you can focus a lot as a product manager on the product itself, but it's the entire life cycle that forms the experience of the customer. And often that's difficult for us because we came from development or we're in development or we're in software. So it's, it's, it's like a big journey and you don't have a, good overview on what's happening there, but it affects each other. The product itself affects the sales cycle. The sales cycle affects the, the product. And well, one particular company that's of course really good at this is Apple, who has this, this idea of the sum of all experiences floating through everything of the product. It's not just the hardware or the software. It is also how they do the sales and the information cycle, how they put came up with this idea of genius bars where you put people in there not to sell you stuff, but to help you out if you don't understand the product. Uh, they have these kind of fan idiots that they enlarge and make bigger. And I've actually been in, uh, when they launched the first iPad, I was working for a company that built mobile apps. I was in the US at the time. And they said, go, go, go get one of the first iPads. So I was in a queue with all these crazy people, which turned out to be rather normal people, just very enthusiastic. But they were really enthusiastic to get up at six in the morning and try to get their hands on the first iPad. And if you emphasize that effect, it, it sort of adds to the atmosphere of the product. So it, it's not just that, it, it's everything that around it. So this is why as a product manager, you should be interested in customer support of your particular product. And Steve said, you start with what you want to achieve with the customer, so the customer experience, and then you start thinking about technology. And often we start a technology and then forget about the customer experience. And when you start mapping out this customer journey and start exploring this, it feels a bit like you're in the matrix and you're, oh, which pill are I going to take? And if you take the wrong pill, um, you will be revealed what customers really think. And that brings us to these initial pictures that we saw. So customers will be like, yeah, but why is this not working on my device? Or, uh, yeah, interesting, but I have no idea how to achieve that. Or uh, I'm phoning with the support desk, but it seems like everybody has died over there. So this this why emotion that you recognized in the beginning. And why should your manager care? Well, it has business impact. These things cascade into real things that bring value. So customer experience is difficult to measure, but the effects of a bad customer experience can be measured in terms of it's difficult to get new customers. It's it, the efficiency of uh, building something that drink, drives value is, is getting lower. Um, retaining users is hard. 
So those are the typical things that we see, but that is difficult to connect to the actual uh, customer experience. Now, how, how does this all work together or how can we bring it together? How can we create a model out of it? Um, I like to create little models. So if you start at the end, if you start with results and you think about what drives the result of your product, and you will find that it is the behavior of your customer, right? So how the customer behaves, how they think about you, your brand, your product, that actually drives whether they buy it or not or spend money or time in it. What drives behavior? Anybody know? Habits, <laughs> dopamine, I hope so, yeah. Yeah, needs, wants, emotion. It has everything to do with attitude. And attitude, so, so what do I think about the brand or the emotion or, the, or the, what is the feeling behind it? And that's really dri driven by experiences. And then we get in the kind of causality loop. So this moves around. Now, for example, you're, you're, you're looking at me through a MacBook. Why am I using a MacBook? Well, because I love Apple products. Why do I love Apple products? Uh, and that's interesting. That has everything to do with the introduction of Windows Millennium. For those of you old enough to remember that, that came after Windows 98, which was an amazing product. And then they introduced a really crappy product. We came into what was called in the time, the DLL hell. I had a lousy experience. That experience changed my attitude towards uh, the Microsoft Windows platform, drove me away from it and moved me into a different ecosystem. I have never looked back. And I'm pretty sure that they have smart people at Microsoft. So there's probably an improvement in their product area. But my mindset has changed. And the only way to change my mindset is to give me a different experience. So um, that is the way to get out of that loop. Often product managers claim a lot about of not having enough resources or not enough tools, of power, but that's not really it. It's really about creating these connective, immersive experiences. So that's sort of where customer journey mapping comes in and why it is important. And I learned from it through a TED talk from uh, Doug Dietz. I highly recommend that you go listen to his story because... I'm just replaying his message and he's, he's uh, uh, well, he's an American so and, and, and it's his story. So he, it is a more emotional story than I would tell it. But um, in short, Doug is a industrial engineer at GE Electric and they design MRI scanners, like these big honky machines. And he's sort of top of his league. This is the best performing MRI scanner. Well, if, you, if there are people here from Philips, then it's the second best, but... Um, <laughs> According to him, this is the best performing MRI scanner. Um, really beautiful, wins an award, aesthetic design, blah, 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 really cool. This is in Stanford Medical. It's about 9 million uh, uh, per device. And he goes in there to do customer research, right? To see his little baby in action. And in the corridor, he meets Sophie. And Sophie is a little girl. She, she had, had a fall, stripped her leg, and, and something is wrong with the leg, and we don't know what it is, so we need to give her an MRI scan. But Sophie is not looking forward to it. In fact, she's, she's terrified of going into that machine. And mom and dad are there to comfort her. But when, when the operation starts or the procedure starts, um, she sort of panics because mom and dad are no longer there because of um, electromagnetic interference. And um, she panics. And the nurses are like, oh, yeah, this happens all the time. So they call in an anesthesia and... Um, Basically, they put her on a full of drugs and no, you fall asleep and you can make the scan. And Doc is, of course, very shocked by this event. Um, and, and the nurses tell him, well, this happens in about 85% of the cases, especially with children. And that's because the machine makes an incredible noise. It's, it's really loud. It's claustrophobic. And it's, it's not a fun experience. Right? Pictures may be really beautiful, but the experience is no fun. And then he's quite shocked. And he goes back and he thinks about, okay, what is the customer experience and how can we redesign it? And that's basically what customer journey mapping is. We go back through the entire experience and try to map that out. And as we do that, we're trying to look for that moments that really matter in the, um, in the experience. And Forrester published a nice 
uh, study on this. And basically, they said that you have all kinds of experiences. You have big experiences, small experience. But what you're looking for are these, these big moments that matter. So those are moments of happiness or moments of despair. Right? And you're trying to look forward for the, the most important moments that happen and try to work and improve from there. Now, many UX companies capitalized on that and, and started offers, offering services, talking to customers and creating these beautiful diagrams, something you, you may have seen these before, like really pretty customer journey maps. And um, your, your manager will tell, don't touch them because they were really expensive to make and they're somewhere on the corridor. And there's nothing wrong with them. It's just that they never update. And if there's anything that you may have learned from 20 years of Agile, is that thing stuff changes. So if you make it hard to change something that was expensive to create, that's not going to change. So what is a different way of doing customer journey mapping? Something that you can do with your team and maybe change for less than $30,000. So... Um, and what we came up with was a very simple brown paper methods. It's full of post-its because Agile post-its are, I think they're made out of post-its. Um, but basically you start on an empty wall, you start with a specific persona. Let's, let's take Sophie. And um, you divide it in two parts because we'll be looking at on-stage actors and off-stage actors. I'll explain later what that is. But we start with Sophie and we start mapping out her behavior. So what actually happens? And you can observe this by just observing your customer. All right, so she, uh, she, uh, she goes to the initial doctor, is diagnosed, uh, gets a recommend, letter of recommendation or, or a referral letter, I'm not sure what the English word is, uh, and goes to the hospital, checks in, sees the machine, mm -hmm, resistance, uh, doctor comes in, ah, let's give her a shot and goes for the machine. That's basically factually what happens. The next stage is to figure out, so who were all the people involved? How can we perhaps use people that are in the process to change the experience. And there's the doctors, the moms, the nurses, there's like a lot of people in there that may or may not affect the, uh, uh, the experience. You could do the same thing for things like, or, or attributes, artifacts is probably what we would call them in Scrum. Um, the charts, the re recommendation letter, the, um, I'm not sure if you could actually do something useful with the tissues, but hey, they're there. Uh, so that's all the stuff we, we might use to influence the journey in one way or another. The difficult part is to look at the attitudes of Sophie. And that's a little bit where the emotion part comes in or the empathy part comes in. What is she actually feeling? And, and that sort of drives her behavior, much like my behavior with uh, Windows Millennium. So there's confusion in there. Am I really sick? Um, she's probably the only kid that wants to be at school. <laughs> but uh, going to a hospital or going to school, I think most kids might actually want to go to school in some way. And she's nervous. She's afraid about, she doesn't know what's going to happen. The hospital is a scary place to be. And the machine is really big, really loud. And the discovery that your parents can't be there at that point in time is terrifying. And then we have the dramatic arc with no, 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 at the end, of course. But, but you can sort of paint the picture. Now, there was stuff on stage. There's also stuff on the back end, things like um, system administrators, uh, the safety, there's a, there's a health registration teams. So there's a lot of people in there that we could use. And there's a lot of systems that we can use. Now, once we've mapped everything out, we can start thinking about, okay, where are the biggest moments of uh, in the customer experience? And the, the easiest way to actually do that is dot voting. You have a team, you observe them, uh, you use the knowledge of the group to figure this out. And obviously in this particular case, it's, it's somewhere where she sees them, see, uh, the machine and figures out that there's no way around it. She's going to have to enter this, this, this dreadful device. That, that's sort of where, where everything breaks down. And from there on, you start looking for metrics that matter because there's a customer experience. But remember, we try to connect it to what does it mean for the business? And when they actually did this, they, they looked at the impact that it creates and they look at, well, actually, it takes much more time than expected to take an MRI scan. 
the idea was that we use this machine like straight through processing and we can do so and so many people per day, but we're not actually making those numbers. And we also see that we need more staff. We need drugs. And the effect of putting somebody under is that one of so many patients has difficulty recovering or has complications when they recover. So there's actually quite a business impact to something as simple as, as somebody that is afraid of a device. So that might be metrics that you want to share with your manager. All right. So th this is sort of where, where, where the pain point is. And what is it that, and then you mentioned that in the chat I saw, the, um, the needs of the patients. Well, what is the job to be done? That's taking the photo. Uh, but what are the needs and the wants? It has something to do with feeling safe in a, in a, um, a complex environment or a new environment or a scary environment. That's sort of where, where the pain point is. And, and the job to be done is still to take the image and process the image because without that, the you know, entire exercise is useless. And, and Doc took this as a starting point and then started to figure out, okay, what are situations in the lives of our customers that resemble this? And he talked a lot to kids to figure out what are these new and moments in your life where you might be scared or but still go through with it or excited about it and it's called ethnography or something like that i'm not sure about the english word um, but basically it means take off your own shoes because we have this rational thinking on how we would approach the situation but that simply does not apply here it's not about you it's it's really about the other person and the idea that they come up with is um a camping trip or, um, yeah, and that has everything to do with living in big brick cities of concrete and uh, at some point in your youth going outside camping without your parents in, uh, in a tent in a small confined space with funny noise and that's scary and exciting. All right, and so there's, there's something there and that's the idea that they want to uh, pursue and see if they can change the experience and therefore change the attitudes, therefore change the behavior. And, and what they come up with is this. Basically, it's just a, a number of stickers. So they painted the entire operation room into a camping site. And this is actually one for cancer therapy where you have radiation shutters uh, on, on the window, just like when you're camping and at the evening, mom and dad will shut down the... Uh, uh, the, the window on your caravan. And, and so that it's, it's connecting to something that is a, a natural uh, moment for them. And it looks like a kind of a, like sleeping bag that they have to lie on. So they try to change the mindset. And um, then they go back to the customer journey map because there is a, <laughs> there's a purpose to this thing. And basically what they do is, okay, if that is the idea, how can we change this, this experience? And what they do is rather than giving you a, a letter in Latin saying uh, you have uh, numerous fixes in your uh, uh, appendix or something, and uh, therefore we need to send you to the, to the hospital, they send them a backpack. You're going on a camping trip and it's going to be really exciting. Uh, there's somebody that meets you outside the hospital in a camping outfit or a scouting outfit. The entire dressing room is changed into like a campsite. They even painted a, a pond on the floor saying, this is a magical pond with magical fish. And if you like really still, the fish will sort of jump over you when you lie still in your sleeping bag. So you play with the imagination of the kids. And it changes the, the mindset of the child that goes to the hospital. And they actually put up a, a CD with cricket sounds and they, they enjoy the experience up to the point that she meet, that, that Doug meets somebody like Sophie in the hallway afterwards and say, oh, this was so awesome. Can we go again? Uh, so it turns from total panic and uh, let's drug these people to can we do it again? And I think that was the interesting part of this, this story. Can you find something that will change the experience around? And yeah, and there's, of course, all kinds of business effects. Huh? So things go faster, less drugs, less side effects. So it's not bad. And we've 
I've, I've done a couple of these. I've worked with Al Jazeera in the past, looking at their news to see how we can transform that into mobile apps and what is the, what are their strengths. And one of the things that came out of that were their pictures. They're, they're very powerful pictures. So how can we make that center and front in their, their applications so people can get the news from gazing at the pictures? Um, there's also a large audience that cannot read. So we came up with a team that would actually create audio versions of the news and broadcast that to all the telephones. So you have like digital radio, but that tuned to your specific news needs, even in your local dialect to make them part of the experience. Much closer to home when we worked at Vacamp, uh, this is actually a picture of their customer journey on the wall um, used in combination with development. So it became a hybrid between a user story map and a customer journey map, always trying to bring to front what, what is it that we're trying to change for our customer? Uh, where's the pain? Where's the biggest benefit? Where, where can we make the, the, the biggest moments of joy larger and, and take it from there? But it all starts in connecting to that customer, like Doug did in that hospital. I, uh, I, I worked for TomTom Tom and worked on the USQ. This is actually part of a UX video where we unboxed the, uh, the USQ and discovered that the European box is different from what Americans are used to. They have these little side lips that sort of click into the side and you cannot open the box by simply pulling at it other than getting really frustrated, which was exactly what happened. And in the right picture, you can see the guy looking for the on-off switch because it was hidden. And we had this little LED light, light on the, on the uh, upper left corner that showed that it uh, was functioning, but it was also a button. And it was very confusing to our customers. So observe customers in their natural habitat and, and try to make life great for them by solving their problems in, in a way that changes the experience because that changes their attitude and that drives their behavior that will lead to more uh, impact for your product. All right, two minutes on the clock. What can we do? Um, three more tips for today. For today, go down to customer support or in case of Zoom, ask if you can spend one hour listening into customer support calls. Figure out what their biggest problems are, what they love about your product. You might be lucky. So I've had one customer in my time at customer support. Uh, granted, it wasn't that long. But I had one customer that found it to, to just tell us how happy he was with the product. That doesn't happen all the time, I can guarantee you. But they will tell you what's wrong with the product. Then create this customer journey map. Figure out a way, even if it's just post-its, even if it's low fidelity, but try to create a graphical design of what your customer goes through. And find a buddy, for example, in the CBI Academy, uh, because that might be outside of your context zone. And might be really cool that if you're a bank and you're a, uh, a clothing shop, have a product owner from a clothing shop look at your customer journey from a bank because you're not competitors. You can do this and give people feedback because together you know much more. All right, let me spend a couple of minutes on the clock. Let's see. Windows 8 9 was horrendous itself. Yeah, but well, coming from 95. <laughs> yeah, so why look at just one person? Of course, you look at certain patterns. Huh? So what, what I typically do is I look at five. And when I've, uh, when I've spoken to five customers, I find a problem. Usually five is enough. And yes, you could do a statistical analysis, say up to 120 people to see if it's relevant. Uh, sometimes you follow your gut on that point. I think if I would ask any of you, if they've been through an MRI scan, and ask them what was the most scary part of that experience, uh, I think you may have come up with the same things. If we can have the slides, where can we find them? You could be able to find them in the community. Uh, so everything goes to community portal of, of CB Academy afterwards, the recordings and the slides, and you'd be able to download them from there. 
Yeah, uh, I think this is also interesting. If you if you have a persona, a group of customers, would you target the biggest group of your audience? And I think that's interesting. Depends on your product, All right? So if your your product is underserving a market, like there's not enough of them and there's growth in the market, yes, I would go for the biggest group. If you're in an overserved market, I might go actually for a smaller group. Because it's, it's already in a saturated market and optimizing for the whole typically won't bring you that much extra. Whereas finding that small group that is not satisfied with your current product uh, may give you an edge at that point. That's actually what happened here. MRI scanners were, tar- were not designed for children because they make up a smaller portion of the uh, patients that you have. However, a, a GE has become the reference case for how to do design in MRI. And that translates into a whole suite of other products. Now, all right. Cool. Well, we are two minutes past the time box. Any specific questions that you want to ask? Uh, all the things in the Bible. One last remark then. Um, we do always say, look at the numbers and act on the numbers. Uh, what we do see is that value stream as we've set it up and how we thought it would develop is not developing as we, uh, we expected. So we are thinking about restructuring it. We haven't really made up our mind how to do it. Um, I have about two more episodes planned. I, I'm planning to do something on design thinking because it's coming it's come and go several times in the question areas. Um, what are things you absolutely want us to cover? If you put that in the chat, we'll try to make that happen. And let's see how we can take it from there. Stakeholder management, no estimates. Evidence-based management, you can find a great recording by uh, um, by the people from uh, the Scrum facilitators who helped us out with on that. I'll, I'll you, uh, put the recording into the community portal. Design thinking, yeah, I can definitely do something about that. I'm not saying it's, it's coming completely to an end. We're just trying to think about how can we make it more effective. Um, we all remember the, the, our beloved phones, so nothing that is awesome needs to remain forever. Yeah? Sometimes we reiterate and come up with something different. But thank you for your feedback. I'll definitely go think about that and uh, see you next week. And next thing, I, I think we can tackle design thinking. Um, yeah, awesome. See you later. Thanks for watching and if you enjoyed this episode, move on to the next one or join us uh, or follow us on Medium and LinkedIn to get inspired with even more content. Welcome to our training. <laughs> <laughs>